today. These sod warriors take to the turf and push their mowers to the max when we check out some crazy motorsports like lawnmower racing. We'll take a trip to Australia from the country that brought us bungee jumping. Now comes the outrageous sport of barstool racing. We'll see unusual cars, some that even come equipped with a little extra outboard horsepower. We'll show you a wild new trend called slick track racing. And we'll visit a southern Florida favorite, swap buggy racing. It's all coming up next here on the Superchargers. The Superchargers, a fast-paced look at the professional and showbiz side of automobiles and more. You're in the driver's seat with cars and stars as we amaze, amuse, and entertain with unique car stories and more from around the world. Welcome to the Superchargers, I'm Jan Gabriel. Now what do you suppose this contraption is? Maybe a thrashing machine out of the 1950s? Nope. How about something new from NASA, like a moon rover? No, that's not it either. This is a swamp buggy, competing in the annual swamp buggy races at the Florida Sports Park just outside of Naples, Florida. And we're going to take a look at some of these strange and unusual vehicles just a little bit later on in the program. And that's what our program is all about today, strange and unusual motorsports. We're even going to take you down to the national championship lawnmower races and a whole lot more. It doesn't get any crazier than that, or does it? Let's watch this first segment, barstool racing. We had to travel all the way to Australia, a country known for its craziness. First, it was the human bar fly, followed by goldfish swallowing. Ooh, yuck. All examples of Aussie pub mania. Now something even more innovative has been added, barstool racing. Powered by 50 and 100 cc motorcycle engines, motorized bar stools are going over big down under, with pub goers thirsty for new entertainment. We've had uh, 75 kilometers an hour in third gear out of it, but uh, we lose our uh, nerve then. Because riding on this at 75 kilometers an hour is very, very tough. Orders have already come in for nine more machines, and Michael Waite hopes sponsors will finance a racing circuit. A Sydney radio station run out and they were looking at running these at uh, the Adelaide Grand Prix and at Eastern Prix. So, the sky's the uh, limit. Anything could happen. And now, Australia's newest craze has come to America. So a bunch of guys decided to build weird, crazy vehicles, and I decided on a bar stool. Uh, if you notice, it's got racing slicks on the rear. It's got a high-tech uh, rack and pinion steering on the front with a uh, downdraft spoiler because it goes pretty fast. And of course a uh, safety belt to keep you on uh, in place when you fall so that everything goes together. Across the country, you'll find literally thousands of car clubs. Clubs for Corvettes and Mustangs and Model A Fords. But recently, we visited an unusual car club. Why? Well, because these cars were unusual to say the least. This is the annual outing of the Arcane Auto Society. The Arcane Auto Society is exactly what the name implies. And since the dictionary defines arcane as mysterious or creating bewilderment, you can imagine that this is a club which includes cars that result in the eternal question, hey, what kind of car is that? In fact, that's the club's motto. Here at Skeggs Point, just off of Route 35 north of San Francisco, we met up with a group of motoring misfits for their annual outing. The Arcane Auto Society was founded, or maybe we should say confounded, in 1982 by three fellows from San Francisco who each owned rather unconventional cars, Paul and Greg Cowden along with their friend Tom DeJong. Now they decided that they had the raw materials for a club. They figured a day trip was a good way to get the ball rolling. Paul picks up the story from there. On that first run, we stopped at a um, garage sale. We pulled off the side of the road in front of this guy's house, and 
we walked up to his um, garage and he said, hey, he said, what kind of cars are those? And uh, he was the one who handed us the first slogan, although we didn't think of it till probably a year later when we heard it about 30 times. We asked some of the other club members about their unusual contributions to this odd organization. I have a 1964 Amphi car. It's a uh, amphibious vehicle, a true off-road vehicle. It was made in Berlin in the early 60s. They made probably 3,000 of them total from beginning to end of production. And it's a gas. It's a terrible boat, it's a terrible car, but it does both of them. And that's something that no other production vehicle has ever done. Other than for shock value, why would an apparently normal human being want a car that can also be used as a boat? I don't know. You know, we live in a flood zone, and so the joke was that we need an amphi car. And I said, well, let's just do it. Well, let's face it, it's not every day that you see a three-wheel tandem cockpit German Messerschmitt Roadster sharing curb space with a Crosley Hotshot, or a Baldy, or a red, white, and blue Fiat 600 on a flatbed truck, or even a Citroen 2CV, which one automotive writer once proclaimed as the world's ugliest car. But the members of the Arcane Auto Society seem to thrive on the raised eyebrows and puzzled head shakes that have become part of their daily existence. In fact, being perceived as a mad hatter is taken as a compliment. I like the attention that we get when we drive into some place that people gather around and say, What the hell kind of car is that? Well, that just happens to be a 1961 Fossil Vega. And that, well, that's a 1950 Riley 2.5 liter Speedster. Only 500 of those cars were ever made. And there's your basic Crosley chassis kit car. And according to the owner, only 28 of those custom bodies were ever built. We asked some of these arcane autophiles what they like most and least about their strange automobiles. There's something adventurous about a car that's 30 years old. You know, it's sort of like, God, I got there. They're terrible to drive. Most of these cars are out of production now for good reason. Well, that may be, but right now it's time to fire up this heady herd of restless, bizarre automobiles and hit the oddball trail. Sprint car racing is a wild motorsport, which can be described only as a high-speed balancing act, where drivers must combine throttle and steering control on a slippery dirt surface. Have you ever wondered what it's like to finesse a race car around an oval track with little traction and lots of competition? Well, now you can give it a shot. This is slick track racing. It's a zany, unpredictable amusement sport that duplicates at a much safer speed the same kind of loosey-goosey, spin-and-grin racing style as a sprint car. For $2.50 a ride, you're more than welcome to head out onto this strange racing service. This is a real adventure where everyone is just trying to get a grip. Slick track utilizes standard commercial go-kart frames and power plants. Now these cars are covered by a non-breakable polyplastic body. There's a throttle and a brake pedal and the cars actually have three different tire sizes on them or what's called in real racing tire stagger which sets the car's handling into a left turn only arrangement. Intentional collisions, undue recklessness, or any number of rule infractions will result in a warning whistle blast from the slick track officials. And if you lose it, well, there's always someone close by to help you get back on track. Veteran slick track racers with a deep understanding of the sport can quickly recognize the various driving styles you'll see here. There's the California classic laid-back style, the aggressive edge-of-your-seat style, the Rapunzel let-your-hair-down style, and, of course, the hey-baby-everything's-cool style. The course is constructed from polished concrete, then covered with talcum powder, which gives Slick Track a, well, Slick Track. Racing mishaps can run anywhere from your first multi-car pileup to a single-car barrier bash, or a four-car fiasco, or your basic get-out-of-my-way exhaust breath body check. Slick Track was invented by this man, Chris Agajanian, the son of the late J.C. Agajanian, who owned the legendary Ascot Park, a longtime venue for dirt track racing in Gardenia, California, until its recent closing. In fact, the first Slick Track race course opened in Anaheim, California, with some remarkable timing. We asked some of these power-hungry Slick Tracksters what they thought of their favorite pastime. It's fast, and it's slick, and uh, you, 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 think you're, you think you're a really good driver and you spent 25 years on the road and all that sort of stuff, but forget all of that because when you come out here, there's a whole new set of rules. There's no control. You just go and hope that you don't fall off and hope that you don't run into someone and break your face. I'm an Air Force pilot, and this is a lot more fun or equally as fun as uh, flying the jets in the Air Force. It takes no brains, you just have to be over four foot six and just go out there and um, don't be too stupid to get mad, they blow their whistle. 
Obviously, Slick Track is a safe way to go racing. In fact, the officials seem to be most at risk, trying to keep control of the situation where there isn't a lot of that to begin with. But everywhere you look at Slick Track, you see people smiling and laughing. After all, they're not stuck in rush hour traffic. They're just out for a spin. Well, there you have it, our first three segments of Crazy and Wild Motorsports. We're going to take a short break, and then we're going to be back with more, lots more. We're going to go to the National Championship lawnmower races and more swamp buggies from Florida. Hi everybody, welcome to the Superchargers. I'm Jan Gabriel with Wild and Crazy Motorsports today. We're going to take you to the National Championship lawnmower races, but right now it's Swamp Buggies. Organized Swamp Buggy racing began in the late 1940s, but the sport has come a long way. Back then, the vehicles were primitive, using mostly Model T engines. They were real contraptions. Today's swamp buggies, however, are a lot more advanced. Now the sport utilizes fiberglass bodies with V-hull construction to skim across the water. In addition to tall tractor wheels, skis have been added to help keep these unpredictable vehicles on plane. Most of the swamp buggies house big V8 Chevy engines, putting out anywhere from 500 to 700 horsepower. Maintenance on these engines is very important. Water damage can ruin your chances of winning a race. Therefore, all engine parts must be sealed. After all the adjustments have been made, it's time for these swamp buggies to prepare for staging and to hit the water. The race course itself is an odd shaped figure eight. What makes it interesting are the deep seepy holes scattered throughout the race area. Seepy holes are man-made drop-offs that range from three to five feet deep. The faster you can hit the seepy hole, the better your chances of making it across without sinking. Sometimes you can just get stuck in the mud. And trying to get back on course, well, that can certainly bog down your chances of winning the race. Now you may be asking yourself, where did these strange and unusual vehicles come from? Well, back in 1917, a man named Ed Franks came to the Florida Everglades for hunting. He soon found out that he needed some sort of woods buggy to help him more easily get in and out of the swamp. It took several years to develop, but by 1923, he had put together what he called a Skeeter buggy. It was built from surplus parts and a Model T engine. So Ed Franks goes into the history books as the builder of the world's first swamp buggy. Today, nearly 70 years later, these amphibious rockets are built by experienced mechanics. There are two Swamp Buggy National Championship events each year, one in March and the other in October. Each is a weekend of fun and festivities for the entire family. The racing itself is very, very serious. These drivers have a lot of time and effort in their rigs. The racing can get very competitive. Wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing is common, and nothing is more exciting than a close finish. As both dash for the line, the finish is decided when a CP hole takes out the leader. And Tom Beatty of Naples, Florida comes out the champion. Well, there you have it, the wet and wild sport of swamp buggy racing. Right now, we're going to shift gears just a little bit and go to McHenry, Illinois, where they recently ran the National Championship Lawnmower Races. Watch these guys. They can cut a lawn in a big hurry. There are three classes in lawnmower racing. These lawnmowers are powered by motorcycle engines. This is a stock machine with an engine that puts out about five horsepower. The crowd seems to really like the factory experimentals. One in particular that has gone through a great deal of transformation is this number 14, with a full fiberglass body and modified engine. On exhibition was this jet-powered lawnmower called the Dixie Chopper. It can mow a football field in 15 minutes. Just like a real race car, these lawnmowers require lots of preparation before a big race, and most have a full pit crew. Even at the National Lawnmower Championships, there is pageantry. The opening parade includes the Marching Lawn Ranger. Then, it's time to go racing. With a huge crowd on hand, the machines are brought to the starting grid. It will be a Le Mans-style start with the drivers running across the track to their lawnmowers, starting them, and then pulling away. There is great anticipation as the last racer pulls up to the starting grid. And now, with Allow helmets on, all is in ready for the going. start. And we're off. It's a good start, nobody tripped. 
With the race underway, the number one machine of Bill Jam from 12 Mile, Indiana was the leader, followed by the rest of the field as they sorted themselves out. Now the course is on a twisty, windy grass surface that is approximately a half mile in distance. It'll be 40 times around and will take well over half an hour to run. There will even be some pit stops for driver changes. Now it's all being held in Grays Lake, Illinois, and it's a perfect day for racing. At this point in time, we should tell you there are no rotating blades on these lawnmowers. They must be removed for safety's sake. The speeds these lawnmowers will reach is a little over 30 miles per hour, and at times they can be a handful. Now, let's keep our eye on the number 14 machine of Rich Salerno of Hanover Park, Illinois. He is starting to move through the field on his factory experimental lawnmower. Speed as, uh, the pit area is already busy with activity as drivers look for problems with their machines and give someone else a chance at the wheel. These turf busters have raced throughout the season at a variety of local events, but this is different. This is the national championship, and the winner will drive away with a small amount of prizes, but more importantly, he will be the reigning national champion. Back on the racetrack, Rich Salerno, the number 14 machine, has gone into the lead. Bill Champ, the early leader, has fallen victim to mechanical problems and is out of the race. Salerno's lawnmower has been highly modified with aluminum and fiberglass, making it a very, very light machine. The engine puts out around 12 horsepower, and that makes it very quick. On most turns, he had trouble keeping it on four wheels. Now, at this stage of the race, Rich is beginning to lap the field. There's no one else in contention. If he can keep it on the ground and has no mechanical difficulties, he can go on to become the national champion. The machines of many of the drivers are now beginning to fail with engine problems. This kind of abuse is very hard on these lawnmowers. In the meantime, Rich Salerno continues to thread the needle through slower traffic as the race begins to wind down. There will be a last-ditch effort by this yellow machine to get back on the same lap with the leader, but he will fail. With Salerno way out front, all anyone wants to do at this point is just finish the grueling affair, which has now taken almost 37 minutes to run. And that's a long time on anyone's lawnmower. The leader now heads into the last turn with his eyes fixed on the finish line. The player holds the checkered flag for the newly crowned national champion, Rich Salerno, as his crew applauds his efforts. It was a great day for everyone, including the spectators. I think it's so exciting. I've never seen anything like it. It reminded me of the Indianapolis 500. I've never been to a race of any kind before, so I didn't know what all the flags meant. I had to ask. But it was fun and interesting, I thought. I wonder how fast my lawnmower goes. Maybe next year. After his victory, there was even more celebration. There has always been an attraction with beautiful cars. Unique and exotic cars are a passion for many. But for most, too far out of reach to actually own. Well now, some of the world's most collectible automobiles are becoming a bit more affordable. The Franklin Mint in suburban Philadelphia is the starting point for a series of precisely detailed miniature automobiles that pays tribute to some of history's most distinctive and significant cars. Mark Denise is the Director of Design and Engineering for the Franklin Mint, and he talks about the evolution of these wonderfully crafted replicas. There was a big niche that needed to be filled between lower priced toy model cars and the more expensive hand-built cars that you would find for thousands of dollars. Franklin Mint decided that a competitively priced model, somewhere around $100, would be interesting to car collectors. We normally try to find historic cars, either the first or the last of a particular model or make. We also listen very closely to our collectors. We have people that write in all the time asking for a specific type of car, and those suggestions are weighed heavily in our selection process. As a matter of fact, we have many collectors who are viewers of the superchargers. Once a car has been chosen to be produced as a Franklin Mint precision model, a fascinating chain of events slips into high gear. An exhibit in the museum traces each step in the process. First, detailed photographs are taken. Then, precise measurements are taken of every component which will be included in the miniatures. The pictures and drawings are sent to a computer design department where every part is projected by the computer in the exact dimensions the finished product will include. A 112 scale prototype is carved by a Franklin Mint artist to ensure that all of the body surfaces and contours have been replicated accurately. Molds are then built for the actual production run. 
and the manufactured parts are hand assembled by the Franklin Mint craftsmen. Right now, let's stroll through the Franklin Mint Museum and admire some more of the fabulous handcrafted models that they offer. Proclaimed as the most desirable Ferrari of the modern era, this twin-turbo Ferrari F40 is a stunning automobile, as is the Franklin Mint counterpart, radiant in that unmistakable Ferrari red paint. Almost 100 years ago, Henry Ford made automobiles for the masses, and the Model T changed the face of personal transportation. The Franklin Mint Model T is a worthy successor to the full-scale original, and although recently introduced, it has become one of Franklin Mint's most popular replicas. When you mention a car for the masses in Germany, the Volkswagen Bug is clearly the choice for that distinction. The Franklin Mint has replicated history's most beloved Econo car with fastidious detail. There are two 1957 Chevys in the Franklin Mint lineup, a flashy Bel Air convertible wearing a sizzling red paint job, and a 1957 Chevy street machine with a chop top, mag wheels, and scalloped flames on the nose. Great drivers like Sterling Moss and Juan Manuel Fangio dominated international sports car racing in the 50s in cars like the W196 Mercedes. The Franklin Mint Precision model includes just about everything the original had except for the bellowing exhaust note. They may be only models, but their importance goes far beyond their collectability. The Franklin Mint's dedication to originality and attention to every detail accomplishes their declared mission of keeping automobile history alive. We're back with just enough time to thank the good folks here at the Florida Sports Park for inviting us to their fine facility. What a great time we had with our crazy motorsports today. And we'll look for you again next time right here on the Superchargers. I'm Jan Gabriel. Bye for now.